Ee, merhabalar, tekrar hoş geldiniz ee, programın ikinci yarısı için. Ee, bugün öğleden sonra bizimle e, Dan Rosengarde bir arada olacak. Biraz önce de yemek de yedik beraber, öyle bir şansım da oldu. Ee, çok yaratıcı bir insan, 39 yaşında, e, dünyanın hemen hemen her köşesinde e, projeleri var ve o da çevreyle olan ilişki bu çevreyle olan ilişki ve sürdürülebilir kavramları üzerine de hem projeleriyle hem de yaptıklarıyla e, imza atıyor. Ben uzun senelerdir kendisini takip ediyordum e, projeleriyle. Bugün e, onu birebir dinlemekte benim açımdan da çok büyük bir keyif olacak. E, umut ediyorum sizler de aynı keyfi bizlerle paylaşacaksınız. Zaten bir soru cevap bölümü de olacak. Uh, ben de hevesle o anı bekliyorum. Dan, uh, welcome to the stage, please. Thank you very much. I'm thank looking you. forward to yeah, it. Thank you. Yes. Hey, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, guys and girls. Um, let's show some ideas about landscapes of the future. And I thought it would be interesting to sort of start uh, with my the f my favorite building, my most favorite building in the world. This is the Pantheon in Rome, which you, I think, all know. And what I think is magical about this uh, building is um, this part, the hole in the ceiling. So just try to imagine, 2,000 years ago, we are light architects. Eh? We go to a client, and the client is a very famous, very rich, very wealthy, a uh, very influential person, eh? one of the most famous persons in the world at that time. And we go there and we present our design. And then we say, we're going to make this building. It's going to cost a lot of money. We don't know when it's going to be finished. People will die building it. And there's going to be a hole in the ceiling. And the client must have said, you are crazy. Eh? The pigeons will fly in. Uh, rain, etc., uh, etc., et and the, and the light designers then said, no, no, no, no, no, no, it's going to stay because it's the light from God. And apparently, they convinced the client eh? because they built it. And so the reason why this building is so beautiful is that there's something crazy about it. Who makes a hole in the ceiling? But therefore, it remains so very modern. Eh? The light changes the space. There's a certain dynamic. Um, and creates a sense of, of harmony with the world around you. And I think this really inspires me to think about the future, to test ideas, to be radical, to not always say yes or, or, or say yes to what client wants, eh? to challenge them a bit. And I think that's somehow in the DNA of the things we're going to see today. So I'm from the Netherlands. Um, and as you may know, eh, Holland, most of it is below sea level. So here you see the famous 32 kilometer dam that we built to protect us. So here you have the sea, and here you have Amsterdam, Rotterdam, etc., the rest of the Netherlands. So this is very interesting. Without technology, without design, we would literally all drown. We would die a horrible death. And my Chinese friends, they are like, are you crazy? You know, do you know how much time, money, love, and energy this costs? Why don't you just move to Germany? It's, it's way safer. But we don't, and we use design to create our own home. But sometimes we forget, and that's why we made Waterlicht, a combination of LEDs and lenses which show how high the water level would be if we stop, if we don't invest in ideas, if we don't have a good government, if we're not aware of the rising sea level, the global challenge we are facing, a combination of LEDs and lenses as a virtual flood and we started to spread, uh, show this around, all around the world in public spaces. Yeah. Can I sound up, light down? Can I have some sound? Sound.
best wel spooky. <laughs> Spacey. Ja. Wat ik het gevoel dat ik erbij krijg is een beetje onder water. Dat je onder een, een, een laag zit. Ja, best wel mooi, vind ik. With the waves above us. And it's, it's magnificent. Ik weet natuurlijk dat we beneden zeeniveau zitten, maar ja, zoals je het zegt, zou dat uh, niet zo fijn zijn als ik dit opeens over me heen ga voelen, nee. So 60.000 people showed up in one evening, eh? And it was really a collective experience. Uh, there was sort of like a podcast, eh, like a radio frequency, sharing stories about, about the power and poetry of living with water. And some people were a bit scared eh, because they experienced floods. They didn't really like it. They left. But most of them were inspired. Eh? How do we make f cities which are resilient, which are future-proof? And how can you use light and design to bring people together and that they're more curious and more future-thinking? Eh? We all know that the world is changing, but how can you visualize that and therefore create action? And uh, this was in Amsterdam, but if you want to if you want to experience it and you're in a neighborhood, we're showcasing it 12 or 14 October in Toronto and 25th and 27 uh, in in Rotterdam. So if you're nearby, I don't know where you live, but you can experience it yourself. Back to this uh, famous dam, eh? this famous dike. So this is our Chinese wall, eh? this is our cultural heritage this beautiful Zen line in the middle of the water. Again, who lives with the water? Who fights with the water? Well, the Dutch do. But because of rising sea level, it was in need of renovation. And so the Ministry of Infrastructure uh, uh, um, uh, reserved a budget of 823 million euros to make it stronger, to make it higher, to make it future-proof. And as part of this big renovation program, the minister also realized that we have to enhance this iconic value. It's not just functional, this is our history, this is our national identity. And they came to us and asked, can you make something to highlight this beautiful icon that we have? Because not so many people know it. And we were very honored to work on that, but at the same time we realized we want to keep it sort of naked, eh? we want to keep it simple. We don't want to add more objects. So we started, oh this is the history, eh? so it built rock by rock, like a lot of work. 1932, and so we started to look at what is already there. Just look at what is already there. So this is already there, 60 floodgates. So they, they have these walls in between, they open and close the walls uh, to let the water in and out. If these fail, we all drown, yes? And they are designed by Dirk Roseburg, who's the grandfather of Rem Koolhaas, another uh, famous Dutch architect. And we started to fall in love with them. They look like temples. They're beautiful. But when we saw them for the first time, they were in a horrible state. They were not well maintained. They looked like the inside of a, of a smoker lung, you know, like ha ha ha. It was really, really dirty and disgusting. So we got the funding to renovate it. And we had the meetings with the government. And in the second meeting with the client, with the government, they said, Dan, we love you, and it's great work, and you work, work with technology and light. But they say, they said to me, it's all great, but there's some rules. We're like, okay, what kind of rules? So there's some rules. They say, no maintenance. We're like, what? Yeah, we know you work with drivers and microchips and LEDs, etc., etc., but it's going to break down eh, because of the salt and the rain and the weather. And it's also a very narrow road. So if you have to do maintenance, you have to shut down the road. Whole parts of the country are disconnected. Everybody gets mad. So rule number one is no maintenance. Um, and secondly, they said no energy because there's no electricity. And the, the energy solar panel, etc., also because of the salt, has a lot of problems there. So we were back in the car and actually, you know, a bit depressed because we had this great project. And all the rules that we had, all the techniques that we had, became meaningless. So we started to go back to the drawing board and said, okay, the buildings are already there. That's sort of interesting. Maybe we can use that. But also, of course, there's already light present on this highway, which is the light of the... I am not being rhetorical here. What kind of light is there? <laughs> this mic works, no? The mic works, yeah. What kind of light is there present on the highway? Streetlight, no, there are no streetlights. Cars, yeah, thank you. The, here, the headlights of the car, oh, that's interesting. 
inspired by the wing of a butterfly. Yeah, so if you ever feel lost in search of meaning of life, you look at the wing of a butterfly. This is not a pigment. This is not a, to a toxic coating. Like the, the colors in your fashion, in your, in your clothes, fade away. Yeah? UV breaks it down. Light breaks it down. Not the color of the butterfly wing. On, it's a structural uh, color. Yeah? So on the microscopical level, it has sort of a cur curvature. Certain amounts of light is absorbed, others are mutated, and therefore the wing of a butterfly always remains vivid. I mean, it's, anyway, I can talk about it for two hours. I'm not going to do that. It's really amazing. So notion of reflection. So we took our Minister of Infrastructure, which you see here. <laughs> That's also a trick with clients. You have to drag them into the story. Eh? Don't talk, just show. Making zillions of these prototypes and mimicking the headlights of the car. And three years later, 324 people, 30 million euro, we renovated them. So here they look at daytime. This is how they look like daytime, like temples again. And this is at night. And you can go there every night for free. No battery, no cables, no wires, no microchips, no solar panel. Purely based on the headlights of the car, the buildings, and the landscape becomes alive. An example of an energy neutral landscape. Can we do sound up a bit? So these are the micro prismas that we developed. And so sort of combining these historical elements with more future, really as a gateway uh, to this famous monument. Um, you know, why do we have streetlights burning the whole night when nobody's there? I mean, that's really stupid. Eh? It consumes huge amount of electricity. There's a lot of light pollution, which is bad for the animals and the trees and the people. So the fun part is if you use this kind of technology, there's only light when the cars are there, yes? So when there are no people, there's no light, no light pollution. And it's just a very sort of simple example of how we can think about light to celebrate history, eh? it's sort of highlighting this, the famous blueprint of the architect, and at the same time think about landscapes which are energy neutral and, and good for the trees and the animals. So right now we're upscaling this and applying it on a much larger scale um, as a replacement for, for normal streetlights. And if you are ever flying uh, KLM, yes, airplane, not Turkish Airlines, but Kalem, also good. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's a movie in the in-flight magazine, uh, in the in-flight entertainment center, called 32 KLM, where the documentary uh, maker, the director, follows me, has had followed me for two years. So it shows the ups and the downs. It shows me being really frustrated when a prototype fails and how we succeeded to make it happen. Um, so if you're ever in the airplane, uh, you, can, you can see the, the beauty and bullshit of doing innovation. <laughs> and that it looks easy, but it's not easy. Anyway, or here, um, we started to explore more with the notion of nature. I mean, that's incredibly fascinating. You know, what, what is this? What are we looking at? I'm not going to say it, so. Guys, what are we looking at? Cells, yeah, well, that's, that's pretty close, yeah. What kind of cells? Sorry? Bacter what? Bacteria, oh, that, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's, that's pretty close. These are um, uh, uh, bioluminescent, bioluminescent algae, sort of plankton. 700 million year old microorganism, and they have a beautiful capacity to give light. Nobody really knows why. It's sort of a side effect of evolution or as a communication language between each other or to scare enemies away when they're being eaten. And I'm a diver, eh? so I go night diving in Indonesia. And when you move your hand through the water at night, 10, 15 meter deep, there's light. And these, these little beautiful creatures are living there. The trick with these kind of microorganisms is that they only live for a couple of days. And the trick with these kind of microorganisms is that they are divas. 
they are horrible divas. If it's like 22 degrees, one degree up that they like, they don't do anything. They stop giving light. And if it's like one degree too low, like 20 degrees, they're also not doing anything. So you really have to figure out the right type of humidity, uh, um, uh, light, they, they feed light, light is their food, vitamin B12 and a secret in ingredient. So we spent two years on growing, nurturing, trying to understand and making the most light emitting algae in the world and to flood these buildings, um, sort of create a floor where they live. And this is the result. So they sleep, but when you touch, they wake up. And there's light, pure nature. And this was really interesting to sort of, on one hand, we look at our ancestors eh, at, at, at the beginning of life, 700 million years ago. But on the other hand, we're looking at the future, you know, um, why or how can we bring nature back into our modern city? And what are the principles of nature that we can apply when we design a smart city? Maybe it's not about microchips and drivers and LEDs anymore, but about this sort of biological materials. I mean, this is not modified. Eh? This is pure nature. You can drink this. Okay, maybe you get a little bit of diarrhea, but still, <laughs> it's a small price to pay. And I think that's incredibly fascinating, um, yeah, to sort of bring nature more back into the world we live in. Like little animals. And so we're pushing this now in London for a big property developer, Crown Estate, to use this as a sort of, in a thermoscan, eh, like a bottle. Um, as an alternative for street lights, living lights. They grow exponential. Very interesting. Or here, these are energy harvesting kites. Very interesting. So you, when you play outside eh, in the wind and you play with a kite, you can feel when you hold the rope how much energy is there, eh? sort of hurting your hands. You feel the power of the wind. So this is Wibbel Okkels. He's one of the first Dutch astronauts who went to the moon came back and said, okay, we're really messing up planet Earth. We should treat planet Earth in a better way, more sustainable. And he started to invent, design things to improve the world around us. And this was one of the ideas, a kite which floats high up in the sky, connected with the ground via a cable, and because of the push and pull on the ground station, like a dynamo on a bicycle, it generates power. Yes? And so here, it's, it's sort of searching for the optimal wind, a lot of technology, pushing and pulling, and you have a ground station and generates electricity. He had this idea, um, but he died in 2013 because of cancer. Never got a chance to realize it. And I met him twice. And suddenly I was in the archive doing some homework and I bumped into an interview, uh, a video interview with him, where he said, oh, this is such a good idea, we should do this on this famous dam, on this dike. He literally mentioned that place. But then already, he was already dead. And I was in his archive, and I'm like, we're going to do that. <laughs> we're going to take his idea. We're going to spend some money, love, time, and energy. We're going to contact his widow eh, and his team of students, and we're going to realize it. We're going to make it happen. And because the cable was so important, eh, the, the energy generating part, we decided to work with Corning, a glass fiber, to make it light emitting. And you get something like this. So you have these sort of zen lines of light floating in the sky. So this is the ground station, the pushing and the pulling of the cable, 20 to 100 kilowatts per hour. That, that's a lot of energy. So energy is everywhere, 
all we have to do is, is harvest it. And each kite, when there's enough eh, strong wind uh, nearby the sea, can produce 20 to 100 kilowatts per hour. So that's enough for 150, 200 households. I mean, that's a lot. Eh? So it's really sort of beautiful to also realize that innovation future is not just about what is coming, but sometimes it's already there, you know, hidden in drawers. Ideas are everywhere, but it's your job to, to grab them, to activate them, and, and, and make them happen. The cable. So this is a, a very strong glass fiber because there's a lot of push and pull, eh? so the, the strength is, is gigantic. So Corning, maybe you know, is a huge glass yeah, manufacturer but also inventor. They worked on the, the light bulb, the Edison. They designed that thing. That's crazy, yeah? <laughs> they made that happen. That's beautiful. Not so long ago, I think, yeah, 100, 150, 200 years. Um, so they, we gave them a challenge and they picked it up. It was really cool to work with them. And the widow came from the Dutch astronaut. This is Joost Okkels, the widow of the, of the astronaut. See, and she's sort of holding on to him. That's really beautiful. And right now, this is traveling around the world to make uh, villages or festivals uh, energy neutral. So the whole opening yeah, that we had with the minister and the, the thousands of guests, the whole beamers and the, the energy uh, consuming LEDs, we're all completely made energy neutral because of these kites. Yeah, practice what you preach. And this one, um, I think it's very weird that when we talk about mobility and innovation, everybody's always focused on the car. Yeah? BMW, Tesla, um, great cars. But what about the roads? And this is a project where we were uh, invited by the Van Gogh Foundation who wanted to celebrate his 125th anniversary and they asked, can you make a place where he feels more alive again? And so we walked around in the area in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, where he worked and lived in 1883, and we found this beautiful bicycle path in that area, in a natural reservoir, eh? so normal LED lighting was not allowed because of the protected animals. And you remember these glow-in-the-dark little stars that you had on the, yes, on the ceiling when you were a boy or a girl? They charge at daytime, glow at night. Like, that's really interesting. So we went back to the lab, making it way more durable, more light emitting. So this bicycle path charges at daytime and glows at night um, as you are cycling uh, through his famous starry night, uh, the famous Van Gogh. And you can go there every night for free. It's still busy every night. Uh, even after four years, uh, the opening was four years ago. And you don't have to buy a ticket as well. It's free. And suddenly a bicycle path became world news. It's really interesting how when you combine very practical ingredients eh, like safety, energy neutral, with very poetic ingredients like art, placemaking, poetry, you create something which is impactful. Um, this is a unique design, first kilometer. And right now we're working more with light reflection also at daytime uh, for Dubai World Expo. And that's going to be a much, much larger one. So it's very interesting to think about highways or paths or bicycle paths as an interface yeah, of information, of history, of future. Why can't we have roads which charge at daytime and glow at night? Yeah, again, why do we have these weird streetlights burning the whole night? It's an example of what is possible. Or here. This is me. This is my job. <laughs> so this is Lotus. So this is very simple. When something becomes warm, it expands. When something becomes cold, it shrinks. This, everything does it. The, the chair you're sitting on, the building we are in, the earth in itself. And so we started to work with a sort of mylar, a high-end polymer. When it becomes warm, it grows. 
and when it cools down it shrinks. Very simple. How can we, you know, bring nature back? And we got a request from Lille, uh, a small city nearby Paris in France, where the mayor invested just a lot of time, money and energy on churches, on the renovation of their cultural heritage. The problem is, with these buildings, is nobody went there. <laughs> so the French, proud of their history as they are, got really frustrated with that. And they called us, they called me, can you make something to make people look at history again, not just future, but at their history. And I like that question or not. So, so we made Lotus Dome from that material that you just saw inside the church. Yes, so the church is dark, unused. And based on the heat of your hand and the light, it folds open. So 14,000 visitors in four weeks. I think we're still getting love letters from 16-year-old uh, girls uh, from this project. So it's really interesting how, how, how something you place something of the future, but therefore you start to reveal the history, yeah? the, the paintings, the little stone angels that were unseen before. So finding a connection between future and history and finding or making a place where you are an activator of the world around you and using light in order to do that is really, really fascinating. Um, and this was for me a very special project in that way. So I'm saying we, because of course, well, we all know that you never do it alone. Eh? We're all standing on the, on the shoulders of the giants before us. Um, so this is Rotterdam. This is us, uh, the design studio, the Dream Factory. So I was the founder 10 years ago. So you have the, the designers, the architects, tec technical engineers over there, project managers, uh, studio manager, and a big studio space where we prototype. So it's very important to have a space where you learn, um, where you work together, where you make a prototype, where you make a mistake, where you do it again, and we love technology. Yeah, I'm the son of a math teacher. Um, I really think tech design are great ways to improve this world around us, and that, that, that's what drives us. And also what is interesting maybe to share, these are the movies that we show to each other in the studio team to inspire each other, talking about light. Eh? This is not computer simulation, this is a colibri, a bird, a male bird. Look at how it changes from color. That's really weird. So purely because the angle of perception of the, how do you say, it, the feathers change, it changes in color. No LED. <laughs> And it's a beautiful example how nature sort of almost outsmarts us eh? uh, uh, in, in, in performance in this way. I think we should just watch this movie for two hours and then, yeah, let's, let's do that. But it's not really fair because the, the colibri, the male colibri, its only purpose um, of the male is to attract female. That's his only job, like full, full, full time. So it's, it's, not, it's not really fair to compare it with, with it, because we, of course, have many, many different things to do. But it is an example of how you can create facades, building facades, which change color, change in behavior, pur purely on the, on the angle and the changing of perception of the eye of the beholder. Or here, um, this is one of my favorites, in Brazil, I met this crazy scientist who dedicated his whole world to the world of ants. And he realized they're very smart creatures because they build these huge systems underneath the ground. This is not a Mars colony somewhere out of space. This is an anthill, an abandoned anthill that he poured, filled with concrete, to discover uh, the world of, of ants. And sort of removing, they discovered this sort of tunnel system of perfect geometry, of perfect logistics. Some tubes had polluted air, some had clean air. 
and he realized they created the system which is like six times the size of the Chinese wall without having a boss or a leader. Okay, there, there's a queen, but she's like diva. She's not doing anything. So they are trained um, as a network. They're working together. Wait. Let me do this one more time. Yeah, here's better. Sorry, it sort of zoomed in, and then you, you didn't, it didn't show you the magic, yeah. So this is n natural made. And again, some tubes had polluted air, some had uh, uh, clean air. They have air conditioning there, eh? <laughs> without electricity. So if you Google uh, BBC and Hill YouTube, you see an hour and a half documentary of this amazing sort of smart city, smart system of the ants working together uh, as a network to create a society that works, eh? where, where, where, where waste for the one is food for the other, where communication is key to create this notion of harmony, and the result is, is astonishing. But what really drives us is this. So when we talk about design and light, some people say, oh, it's decoration. Eh? It's like a nice to have, and I think that's wrong. I think that's not true, it's about reforming. It's about rethinking how we want the world to look like. So World Economic Forum, which you see here on the right top, um, is one of the think tanks in, in the world, based in Geneva, and did an interview with a lot of smart people all around the world, asking what are the top 10 skills you and I need um, to become successful. Yes? So I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the shortcut here. <laughs> this is going to save you 10 years of, of horror. So this is very interesting. Look at this. Number, number three, creativity. Number two, critical thinking, number one, problem solving, complex problem solving, all the things a computer or a robot is really bad at. So it's not about money, it's not about technology, it's our capability to learn. Why are we here today? We want to learn, we want to progress, we want to share. So yes, we will live in a highly technological world where taxi driver disappears, a self-driving car, you know, the accountant will disappear because of the software, etc. A lot of things will disappear or change. But that may be that our human skills, yeah, our desire to create, our desire to explore, our desire to learn, will become more important as that this is something computers cannot really copy. So you will go to this fair, not just to buy things, but to learn, because that is what separates us uh, from the machines. Yes? That is our new added value. And so I believe we will live in a world where creativity is our true capital. Yes. So it's beyond the nice to have or the decoration. It's the new economy, very simple. And that's important because cities have become machines that are killing us. Yes, there's no simpler way of saying it. I love China, I worked for it many years, but this is Beijing from my room four years ago. Good day, bad day, yes? City so polluted, you almost start to smoke again just to feel healthy, yes? Ha. <laughs> So we live eight to nine years shorter. Children have lung cancer when they're six years old. And in a weird, beautiful way, I became inspired by Beijing smog. <laughs> it happened. And I said, we should do something with this. I'm not gonna wait for government. I'm gonna do something now. And I remember when I was a boy playing with this plastic balloon, when you polish it with your hand, it becomes, again, not rhetorical, Guys, come on, what happens when you polish a balloon? You know this. What happens? Yeah, yes, you do. <laughs> static. It becomes static. Yeah, very good. Yeah, thank you. It becomes static electrified. Um, it, and it sort of plays with your hair. It attracts your hair. I remember that as a boy when I was five, six years old. And I'm like, that's really interesting. Okay, so two days later, what if we would use that principle to literally build the largest smog or vacuum cleaner in the world, which sucks up polluted air, cleans it, and releases clean air. Let's make a place in the city where people can breathe clean air for free yeah. and enjoy the future. Oh, this is how it starts. Eh? I, uh, was, I didn't know anything about air purifiers. I was an amateur. Yes? Now I'm expert. I was an amateur then. When you do something new, you always start as an amateur. That's the fun part and the difficult part. So you put some smart people in a room, yeah, my own team of designers and engineers, with a pizza hotline tagged on the door, 
and you say nobody leaves until we have a solution, yes? And one year later, we built the first one. So it sucks up 30,000 cubic meter per hour, eh, the size of a soccer stadium, capturing the PM2.5, PM10, the ultra-fine particles, and then releasing the clean air. So we have parks which are 20 to 70% more clean than the rest of the city. China government started to call, eh? how much, how much? That was, in it. that was funny, in Chinese. That was weird that I understood that actually. But, and uh, embrace it as part of their, their war on smog. Um, so it's, it's always a long-term collaboration, eh? not, not short-term, but long-term with uh, Dutch embassy, China central government, United Nations, and uh, yeah, this Dutch guy who talks a lot. Yeah. And the locals started to embracing it, calling it eh, like the, the clean air temple. If cities have become machines that are harm us, let's build machine that can heal us, eh? that can cure us. Why not? Technology is positive ionization, um, which is already used indoor in hospitals, which can clean huge amount of air, polluted air, in a very safe, low energy um, way. And a lot of scientific research has been done by the Technical University of Eindhoven, which validates eh, the size and the intensity of the cleaning. So it's a lot of tweaking and learning and science behind it. And this is in Poland. That was very cool. You see these little doggies here? You see them? You see the dogs? So I, was at the I arrived at the day of the opening in Poland, in Krakow, where this tower was placed. And the project manager, Nick, was there and everything was ready. We're like, okay, we wait for the opening. But then suddenly, there were like tens of these little dogs hanging around the tower. It was like this weird David Lynch movie I walked into. It was like this secret meeting I wasn't invited for. And I'm like, what are these dogs doing here? These little dogs. And they look really happy, eh? They look really happy. And, and my project manager is like, well, I don't know, you know? So I'm like, well, let's find out. And that's what we did. And so what happened, this is a true story, what happened is these dogs, as we know, dogs have a very high sense of smell, eh? Yes, they can smell 200, 2,000 better, more than us human beings. So they have a really big problem with smog because they, it's like hitting them in the face every minute. And they're really tiny, eh? tiny lungs, so they cannot really process it. So apparently they could smell the clean air from far, far away in the city and they abandoned their owners and started to hang out around the tower, you know. And you, I like this, they're really happy. You look at this one, yeah, here in the tail. This one tries to be happy, but it's really small, yeah. <laughs> So, so this was not really the scientific research we were looking for. <laughs> but it's very interesting that when you do something new, things happen, you know, that you don't know. But you have to look at them and you have to try to learn from them. And if, if nature is capable of feeling what is good or not good for them, why can we not do that as human beings? And this is in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and the cleanest air in the, in the city. And... Um, Oh yeah, and there we have rabbits. Yeah, so that's, yeah. So it's a beautiful way of, of saying true beauty is clean air. Not the Louis Vuitton bag or the Ferrari, but I want to have places which are good for me. And also we learn, this is Beijing smog. Eh? So this is the stuff that we were sucking up from the sky. Sort of kiss of black death. This is disgusting. Eh? So if you live next to a highway, it's the same as 17 cigarettes per day that you passively inhale. 17, one seven, yes? Without the pleasure of the nicotine, yes? That's a bad deal. That's a, so we had buckets of this stuff standing in our studio and then we're like, let's do something with this. 42% is carbon, and when we put it on our little microscope, carbon under high pressure, you get, <laughs> not rhetorical question. <laughs> Guys, what happens when you put carbon under pressure? Diamonds, thank you, thank you for saying that. Diamonds, that's interesting. Ah, so inspired by that, we compress it for 30 minutes. And so by sharing a ring, you donate a thousand cubic meter of clean air to the city where the tower is in. And this changed everything. Because while we were working on this project, we had a money problem. Nobody wants to pay for clean air. Eh? Everybody's like, yeah, very good, we're proud of you, blah, blah, blah, a lot of compliments. But nobody wanted to, you know, chip in, invest. Because the mayors all around the world said it's a really good project, but if we invest in this clean air project, 
everybody will know that we are a polluted city. <laughs> and we're like, well, if you, live, if you live downtown Delhi or Beijing, I think you already more or less know, but they were hesitant. So we put this online, crowdfunding, people started to prepay it. So the finance we made with the jury helped us to build the first tower. That's new economy, that the waste isn't the waste, but it's the activator, it's the enabler. Um, and besides the, the, the money, because money, you can get anywhere money in the end, it's community, that's even more interesting. This is a wedding couple photo that was sent to us a couple of weeks later. No actor, eh? true, true, true, true story, where he proposes to her with the smog free ring eh, as a sign of, of, of beauty, as a sign of, of hope in a way. And um, so we called them to check, and uh, she said yes to him. Yeah. So. <laughs> I checked two weeks with them. They're still married. Yeah, somehow I, I feel responsible for this marriage, <laughs> which I'm not. But, and this is really cool. In the beginning, we're like, nobody's going to wear pollution at his finger. Well, they are. They are. Prince Charles has uh, the cufflinks. And we, we put a little microchip, a uh, little GPS in it. So, so, so I know where Prince Charles is. That's really. No, no, we didn't. We didn't. <laughs> but I think I have one here, actually. Have it? Oh yeah, here. You can show it around. Don't worry, I'm not going to propose, but... <laughs> yeah, she said yes. Yeah, good. So this is, you know, these problems are so big, so, so let's make it small, yes? Let's make it shareable. And it's a conversation breaker and opener, which really helped to push the project. Even today, uh, yesterday, it was published in New York Times four-year-old project, you know, a wedding ring with a dirty little secret. Well, okay, fine, as long as you spell my name right, that's fine. Yeah. So it's really interesting, technology, science, but also design and imagination can work together uh, to create a more sustainable world. And last but not, not least, and then we have some time for, for, for questions, I have 982 more slides, but we're not going to do everything today. Um, what is this? You know, so you cannot say. What are we looking at? And you also know, so you cannot say, yeah, <laughs> because they know it. What are we looking at? What, do I have to like give away rings to get answers here? How does it work in Turkey, guys? Come on. No, I'm joking. What are we looking at? An atom, uh, atom. no. The universe, oh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. But what, what is in the universe? Stars, yes, yes. But these are, these are not stars, but you're getting close. So what is, what is this part? What is this? Yeah, I'm looking at you, yeah. <laughs> planet Earth, very good. So what's the stuff around planet Earth? Gas? No, you're getting close. Planes? No, no. More annoying. Magnetic ring? Oh, you're, oh, you're almost there. Yeah. Sorry? Slop? Can you? Sorry, can you repeat? Like. Scone? I can't. Sorry, I, I'm having the stage. Here. Oh. No pressure. Sorry. Stone? Stone. Stone. Yeah, that's really good. This is space junk, space waste. So this is, um, in 1957, the Sputnik Apollo was launched, and pieces of satellites, missiles, started to break and collide. This is, this is junk. More particles create more collisions. So we somehow started to create this layer of junk around our planet Earth. And we were working on the studio on a project and suddenly I saw this image and it, yeah, is it, is it atom? Is it like paint? Is it like a Pollock painting? And we became sort of obsessed with this. So this is our new project where um, we're working on space waste. And why should we care? Because if a tiny, tiny particle, because of the high speed, it goes 25,000 kilometers per hour, if it hits an existing satellite, 
satellite goes down, no more Facebook, no more banking, no more internet, no more Instagram. Yes, nightmare. <laughs> so although it's very far away, 20,000 kilometers away, it's also very close. And the weird part is, um, it's going to get worse. So more satellites are more collisions, are more uh, pieces, et cetera, et cetera. So somehow, and this is called the Kessler effect, if we keep on going, um, there are so many particles that there's this layer of junk around our Earth that we cannot launch new missiles anymore. So within 30 years, basically, we're trapped. Yes? We cannot launch more new stuff. So in 30 years, you and I will have to have a conversation with our grandchildren saying, okay, the good news is we discovered uh, life uh, on, on, on a different planet, but the bad news is we cannot go there. Eh? That's not the conversation I want to have. So the weird part is also ASA, SpaceX, NASA, nobody really knows how to clean it. They have ideas with a, with a web uh, or with a net, or with a laser or a robot arm, but nobody knows how. And so this is our new project um, that we're launching the 5th of October uh, for the coming months. If you're in the Netherlands, come by, where we're visualizing it real time with light, showing how much space waste is above your head eh, with, with light uh, um, uh, uh, projections. And at the same time, can we capture it? And can we do something with it? We shipped it for billions of euros in space. Can we upcycle it, recycle it um, to, to 3D print on the moon? or when we attract it to the planet Earth and it burns in the atmosphere, can we create artificial falling stars as a replacement for polluting fireworks? So I'm looking forward to uh, meet you in the coming two years and we'll keep you posted on this, uh, on this project. So if you want to know more or download everything or share, everything is right here. And I'm looking forward to hear your questions and have my ring back. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Yes. Okay. First of all, uh, thank you, John. Uh, this is oh, yeah. to translate, translate the yeah. questions. Yeah. So, questions. Uh, shall we go back to the oh, stage? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I you, you want to do, you wanna do questions or we do audience questions? Well, I have to start, then they have the courage. It's like this. No, so. But Turkish people are very courageous. I know. Yeah. Okay, but well, I'll listen to you. Yeah, okay, cool. I just start and they, I leave the word Deal. to someone else. Okay. So it was very inspiring. Thank you very much for okay. doing what you do, and I hope you'll keep up doing that. Um, one thing that we've been discussing, um, how, how was the process you getting a new job? I'm not asking in the, you know, trade secret part. I'm just interested in how people are interested in what you do in terms of sustainability and the relationship with the yeah. environment. H how is this happening? Especially, I mean, okay, I understand if you work in Europe and USA, okay, but China, like, it, it, I, since the day yeah, I heard about it, it's, it, like, it really shocks me. How do you work in yeah. China? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy. I, I remember the first time we met with China central government four years ago, big client, eh? big, big client. And we were trying to reach him for two years. And then he finally walked in, into the room. We finally had the meeting with the top official government. And he walked inside and he so, sort of scanned me, eh? like reading me. And he asked one question, which is the most embarrassing question I will never forget. He looked at me and asked, where is your boss? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm the boss, you know, it's my studio. And he's like, no, no, no, no, no. And he left, he walked away because they're very hierarchy, eh? so you have to be old and a bit gray hair. So, um, Maybe uh, clothes also. Um, no, no, I had a nice jacket, it was, okay. was fine. But still, I mean, it's, it's, it's, it's a different perception of authority. So what we do is 60% is commissioned, like a museum or a ministry, and some do it out of love because they want to promote culture, and others do it because they have a problem. Right. Smog is a problem, energy bill is a problem, and we can fix it. And 40% of what we do is self-commissioned. So I spend my own money on starting it, because in the beginning, people are always a bit hesitant. But skeptical, once it's, maybe. Yeah, skeptical, of course. But once it's there, everybody wants it. So, so you have to find clients who have a problem or have a love, and you have to kickstart your own projects um, to make them go, grow and to make them mature. Okay. Yeah. 
So that, that's, that's how you do it. And yeah, you just, you need to push it. You need to fight for it. Yeah. And one it's more not easy. Yeah. One more question before I leave the sure. uh, questions to the audience. And are you planning or is there any work that you do outside of sustainability and the environment relationship? Like, uh, is there any artistic job that you do which has nothing to do with energy or environment or sustainability? Yeah. No. No, okay. Thank you very much. So we can have... Next question. Yes, some <laughs> questions. If there is one, there's one already. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Stone good. Stone Age. Stone! Yeah. Do we have a mic? Yeah, thank you. Teşekkürler. Türkçe sorabilirim değil mi sorumu? Evet. Of course, I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> E, tasarımları yaparken kültürün, o ülkenin kültürünün de göz önünde bulundurmasının önemli olduğunu bir önceki konuşmacımızdan dinlemiştik. Siz de e, sunumunuzdan görüyoruz ki dünyanın birçok yerinde tasarım yapmışsınız. Çin'e, e, farklı ülkelere, Fransa'ya. Kültürü dikkate alıyor musunuz bu tasarımları yaparken? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, yes, of course. The, the history is a very interesting ingredient. Uh, to use when you're designing something um, but also wind or water or the headlights of the car so you really try to look at an environment and see what are the ingredients I can use to make something um, so yeah it, it, it starts with the location yeah location is very important so it's funny we're working now on a very big exhibition in a museum in a white cube eh? And for us, it's very difficult <laughs> because we cannot communicate. It's a white cube. We cannot touch anything. So we're really struggling with that. It's very difficult for us because we cannot, can't have a dialogue. So I love public space for that uh, because there's so many things you can grab and transform. And it's for everyone. Yeah? People don't have to buy a ticket. Um, there's an incredible power in, in making proposals. Eh? In, in my studio, I don't believe in opinions, but I leave, believe in proposals. So if you do a project um, and you don't agree, which is fine, eh? or the intern doesn't agree, or the senior designer, that's okay, but then what is your proposal? Um, so that's also part of the process that we have in the studio. The sort of context is important, but it's always a sort of a communication and a dialogue with the world and the team around you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, lady up front. Uh, hello. hello. First of all, thank you for the presentation. It was really inspiring. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, two questions, one, okay. One of them is, uh, one of them is uh, according to your projects, you need to make some more uh, detailed scientific researches, how do you finance it? And the second one is, I think your job is far beyond lighting design. How do you describe it? What's your motivation? Okay, so I'll start with the, with the, the, the, the second question. Yeah? Like it's, it's, you say it's far beyond lighting design, how do you describe it? Well, I don't, I don't describe it, I explore. <laughs> so when I was 16 and my parents asked me, Dan, what are you gonna do? For, for, for education, eh? you have to choose a profession. And then I said, I want to do art, and I want to do entrepreneur, and I want to do travel, and I want to do technology. And then everybody got really worried. <laughs> and they were like, well, okay, well, this is gonna not. So for two weeks, they did like this um, profession test, eh? like this sort of, what do you like, what you don't like, and uh, with a psychological person, and the dean, and, and tutors. Anyway, after two weeks, the result was done, what you want does not exist. And I remember being 16, very young, um, that I was very depressed for one day, yeah, because in a way the world says no to you. But then the second morning, the second day I woke up and I realized, well, but if it doesn't exist, then I'll just do it myself. And I think that's the mentality you need um, if you want to make new things happen. So of course you have history and you have technology, and you have tradition and craftsmanship, very important. But you need to be curious, and you need to let the idea guide you. And so defining it is sometimes not really helping you, um, but exploring is. Yeah. 
And the first question I forgot. Yeah, sorry. Um, it was about the um, financial part of your oh, scientific yeah. research. The finance, yeah. So that's the tricky part because everybody wants to pay for product, not for process. Eh? I mean, I think you, you must have the same experience. So what you do is, well, what I said before, sometimes you get commission eh, from government and the, the money that we make, the profit that we make, we don't buy an expensive car, but we start our own projects, eh, like the Lotus foil or the smog free. I, that was my money and then client comes later. Um, and you come up with new creative solutions like the ring, eh, the jewelry making, uh, finding a way how to activate community. Uh, so you have to keep on investing in that process to get concrete results. Yeah. But the business side is we can do a whole different lecture series about that. Because you're right, it, that's, that's the tricky part, finding the right client who understands, who wants to invest in it, who wants to take a risk. Eh? I mean, it's something new. Uh, but the fun part is once you've done one or two projects which are successful, they get more comfortable and you just have to hold their hand and say, don't worry, it's going to be okay, here's my number, call me when you're worried. So a lot of it is about sort of saying, relax, take a chill pill, my job is to worry, not yours, and it's going to be good, yeah. And prototypes, eh? like you, you remember the photo with the minister, with the, show it, the power of a prototype, it's so good, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. How much time do we have? Uh, last five minutes, but I have... Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Please. No, no, no. Please. Please, please. İsmim Ertan Güven. Şirketinizi ilk kurduğunuzda çalışanlarınızı seçerken onları ne söylediniz? Hayallerinizi anlattınız az önce. Çok güzel, değişik bir fikirle yola çıkmışsınız. Sorry. Yeah. Can you translate? Of course. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> When you found out your company, uh, the first employee that you have, oh, yeah. what did you explain to them when there was nothing? You know, did you talk about your dreams and ah. your ambition? That's a really good question. That, that's the first time I got, ever got that question. That's really good. Yeah, where do you start? That's a good question. Yeah, how do you start? Well, you start with nothing. <laughs> You st I mean, I, my first people, 10 years ago, I paid in pizza. <laughs> okay, not anymore, and now I pay them well, and uh, like have a job and a contract. And, uh, so in the beginning, it's just an idea. And, but I've always had people, like technology people or engineers, who say, oh yeah, I wanna, I wanna do something. So you have a dream, you have an idea, you have a big idea. And then you put some people together, and you make a prototype, and you start telling stories to everyone, eh? to your grandmother, to your wife, to, I mean, everybody went crazy. It's like, yes, Dan, we know. So you just start staring. And then suddenly Tate Modern, a eh, big museum in London, heard that story somehow, I don't know how, and they called us. And they were like, oh, can we have one of your installations? That was with June, the sort of light fibers, interactive light. And we got the call and they called and at first I thought it was like a prank, you know, like it was a joke from a friend. I would have modern, we're like, yeah, right. Like, <laughs> and then they called again and we're like, oops, I think it's the real one. <laughs> so it's a big idea, a good group of people, a lot of work, eh? a lot of hours and a little bit of luck. Yeah, yeah. And we call that in the studio right now, we call that Maya. We call that Maya. Um, most advanced, yet acceptable yes most advanced yet acceptable so if you have a project there's an edge so if you go too far yeah, if if it you die yeah? it fails it doesn't work clients goes crazy you go over budget not good but if you stay too safe it becomes boring or nobody cares or your competitor does it so you always have to try to find the edge of what is and what is not possible and that's the balance. And that changes because our society changes, our technology changes, what we want from reality changes. So finding that edge, that is the essence for me of design. That is my job as, as founder. Um, yeah, that, that makes it so interesting. Yeah. I guess it's the essence of life also, finding that balance, you know, like... Uh, it's, uh, last question. Uh, okay, last question for Don. Um, if anyone has one, no. no silent, eh? Yeah. Are they always so silent? Yeah. 
time to time, not always. Okay, last question from me, and then we have to go. So I was going to ask it while we have the beer tonight, but I can ask it now also. Uh, would you be okay to replicate? Yes. No. Uh, would you be okay to replicate what you do in different parts of the world? Like you do a project specific to a place, then would you be okay to take it to another place, a little bit replicating it or making a little bit productish? You know, would you be okay with it? Yeah, it, yes, yes. I, I, I, I don't believe in a copy-paste, but I do believe in a, in a copy-morph or a copy-more. So it's the same but different. So the bicycle path, we are making different versions. Uh, the technology is, remains the same, but the design change is based on location. Uh, Smog-free tower as well. So, yeah, I think it should not be a, a, a special, a one, only a one thing. It should grow and become part of a new standard. Yeah, so growing and letting the eye agree. But for some projects, it works, and for others, not so much. Like Lotus Dome eh, in the church, yeah. there's only that one. Was, okay. We keep it special. But for example, with the towers, the small freak, I'm like, no, just place it everywhere, you know? Like, yeah. Um, Maybe so even it, it, make it small for the household. Well, we're working now, it's still secret, so don't put it on social, but on a, on a <laughs> floatable, a silent floatable above your head. Okay. Like a body which gives you clean air. Uh, okay. So you can walk in polluted cities and still, you know, not die. It's yeah. like the beer drinking hat, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, something like that. You yeah. held it, okay. Yeah. Hey, thank thanks, guys, for your time and looking forward to... Uh, thank you to very much, Stan. Time. I'm very inspired and I'm, I'm sure good. everyone is also. Keep up the good work and thank you very much again. Thanks, Parker. Yeah, thank you.